And now it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ruth Williams to the stage to provide an overview of glaucoma. Hello everyone, I am so happy to be here today. First of all, I wanna tell you, I'm from Chicago and two of my patients are in the audience today and flew in here for this, so I, it's such a fabulous idea to bring us together and talk about glaucoma. I use the educational materials from Glaucoma Research Foundation in my practice and the materials are sitting out and my patients really appreciate it. In fact, everything I'm gonna tell you today or we're gonna talk about today is on the GRF website, glaucoma.org. So if anything I said, you said, oh, that's interesting, it's on the website. The first thing I wanna say as a physician, what I experience is that my glaucoma patients are terrified. And even the many patients who don't look afraid come in very afraid. And so one of my jobs is to walk the journey with you. And I've had a number of patients as they're leaving from the first visit said, I was so scared and now I'm not scared anymore. So information is power. And I think the greatest power of information is to make us feel more confident in the journey. And Amanda's story is the perfect story about information and early diagnosis changed the course of her life. So what is glaucoma? First of all, it's not a disease. Glaucoma is a group of diseases, a whole bunch of diseases that have some things in common. And the, the thing in common is that there is damage to the optic nerve in a fairly patterned way. It's a certain kind of damage to the optic nerve. But many different things can lead to that kind of damage. Most commonly, it's associated with elevated eye pressure. So the eye constantly makes fluid. It it makes fluid to keep the eye bathed and to keep a normal amount of pressure in the eye and it constantly drains the fluid so the fluid's going through. And different factors can cause that eye pressure to go high and I think of it a little bit like an, a, a car tire that's a little bit overfilled. The other really important thing for patients to understand is that glaucoma is chronic and progressive. So we, at this point in time, we don't cure your glaucoma. So if you come in and have a trabeculectomy like Amanda did or another procedure that many of you have had, it doesn't fix your problem. It manages it at this time. Someday we're gonna come back here and have a different story, but that's the story right now. So here's a photograph of the optic nerve in the back of the eye, and here's how I describe what's going on with the optic nerve to my patients. So the nerve endings for the photoreceptors in the eye where the, the cells that help us see collect all together in a cable, the nerve. The cable goes back to the brain and it connects into the brain. And that cable goes out of the eye in an opening and those, a simple way to think about it is the, all those nerve endings hug the edge of the cable almost like a car tire. And in glaucoma, you get thinning of that tissue as you lose some of the, um, of the cells. The pressure causes damage to the cells. They actually die, and so you get thinning. And the most common place to get thinning is down inferiorly. So when your doctor examines your eye, he or she is looking at that nerve very carefully and looking for telltale signs. Now this is a gorgeous optic nerve. And if you look at it, you can see that there are blood vessels coursing through the lumen to and from the brain. And one of the reasons that the eye is such a, a innovative space to be doing neurologic research in general is that we have access to it we, and we can see. 
So a lot of the groundbreaking work that's being done in neurologic diseases in the eye. So when we figure out how to do things in the eye, then we'll also be able to treat things like Alzheimer's and spinal cord injuries and, and other things. So as that optic nerve thins, it causes changes to um, the visual field. And probably every, most of you had uh, visual field tests. And um, I'm going to tell you uh, a cartoon that I saw. I just thought of this just now, so it wasn't planned. So um, you'll probably all hate taking visual fields. And um, it's, it's a cartoon with two um, prisoners. And they're in the dungeon you know, in the Middle Ages at the bottom of the tower. And one of them's on the rack, you know, getting stretched out on the rack. And the other one's hanging by shackles from his hands. And the one hanging by shackles says to the other one, well, at least you didn't have to take a visual field. <laughs> so if you look at this slide, it shows the progression from what we call pre-parametric or damage that is so subtle it doesn't show up in the visual field yet to an early visual field damage to more advanced and then to more advanced disease. And this is what happens with untreated disease. And this is sometimes what happens even with treated disease. But our favorite thing, my favorite thing, is when we find glaucoma patients at those early stages because we can intervene and really affect the course of your disease. So that's why education about glaucoma is so important. We want to get, we want to find people at the early stages of their disease. This is a, I, I just took this off a patient um, that I saw on Monday. And I took this picture, put it on here, because I want to show you why we miss glaucoma. This is fairly severe disease. In one eye, you can see that there's a visual field defect superiorly. By the way, that correlates to thinning on the inferior part of the nerve. Because when the nerve fibers go back, you know, they upside down and flip. So if you have a superior defect, that correlates to inferior thinning on your optic nerve. So this patient has some superior visual field changes. And then in the other eye, superior changes, but they come into the central vision. Amazingly, with the amount of uh, visual field loss this patient has, um, she didn't notice it. And here's why. The two visual fields overlap. And so that central vision in one eye, she hadn't noticed yet. And once I showed it to her, then she could see it. And that's another reason we miss fairly um, severe disease sometimes. Then the optic nerve scan is a, um, optic nerve scan is another way that we look at disease. And it measures the thickness of that nerve tissue. And so in this picture, you can see over towards the right that that tissue is thinned down. And that's one of the diagnostic tools that we have. So who gets glaucoma? What are the risk factors? The most important risk factor is elevated intraocular pressure. So what's interesting about it, my patients will often say to me, well, so at what pressure do I get glaucoma? And there's no answer to that because some people with fairly high eye pressures actually don't get damage, and some people with very normal or even low pressures can have severe damage and progressive disease. So the absolute value of the pressure isn't what it's important, it's what's that pressure doing to your eye. So diagnosing glaucoma is a very personal thing. We do it one patient at a time. And it's actually why glaucoma specialists are, um, it's, why, it's why I have a job, is because it's a lot harder than you'd think. When it's easy, it's easy. But often, it's very difficult to um, figure all this out. But the um, elevated intraocular pressure, statistically speaking, an abnormal pressure is something over 21 or 22. So sometimes my patients will say, well, um, my, you know, doc, you're making my pressure be at 12. My next door neighbor has glaucoma and her pressure is 18. Isn't that horrible? 
isn't her doctor doing a bad job? And I say, no. You know, we, we decide or make these educated um, decisions. Uh, educated guesses, that's a bad word. But it is a little bit of an educated guess about where you should be. And we set a pressure, and then we work toward that and make sure that we're right. So another risk factor is um, age. So the, um, as we get older, as we age, which we all do, um, the risk of glaucoma um, increases with time. Race is an important risk factor. So for example, um, African Americans have a much higher risk of developing glaucoma than other populations, and the glaucoma tends to be more severe, and it tends to be diagnosed at a younger age or start at a younger age. As an example, if you um, go to China or people from certain Asian um, uh, ancestry, ethnicity, the, um, there's angle closure glaucoma or narrow angle glaucoma is much more common. Um, in the US, there's a higher risk of open angle glaucoma among Hispanic people who have a higher, higher incidence at older ages, but not necessarily at younger ages. Nearsightedness is a risk. So if you have, you're very myopic or very nearsighted, that can be a risk factor, and family history. So family history is very important. So glaucoma diagnosis, um, we use all these different tools together, the visual field, the OCT, and the optic disc. A couple weeks ago, over lunch, I filmed some of my patients asking them about why their physician was important to them and what the physician-patient relationship was like and what they thought about having glaucoma. So I think I asked the four or five patients right before lunch, would you mind staying? And here's what they say. These were picked because they saw me right before lunch. <laughs> and um, um, the, the point of this video is to share with you the perspective of um, some of the people who um, really their their own experience it is with scary glaucoma. To have glaucoma, I would be afraid of losing my eyesight or not being able to see exactly what I'm doing. Being a pastry chef instructor, we do very creative, very intricate things, and so not being able to to see that would be very heartbreaking for me. Condition glaucoma. I know it's, it's with me for the rest of my life, but it's so nice to have a partner, and I see you as my partner in this. Every time I come to you, I, I feel um, a certain level of anxiety because I don't know what, you know, what I'm going to find or what you're going to find, but then I leave and I'm so happy I want to celebrate. Having the same physician, you know, for a long period of time is very nice because you form a relationship with them and you feel calmer because you trust this person. Well, I do my drops every day, you know, for my glaucoma and wear my good sunglasses at all times. And I have all my confidence and faith in you. I do what you tell me. I certainly respect you as my doctor and the comfort you gave me from the moment I sat down. I never had any reservations about you shooting lasers in my eyes. <laughs> well, I, I think the, the interaction, uh, just talking to a doctor, make the uh, feel uh, comfortable and, and good. I text my sisters and I told them that I needed to have the laser done. And they text me back, aren't you afraid? Oh my gosh, Nancy, aren't you afraid? And I said, no, I just, I left the clinic with total confidence. And even the moment that I had it done, my husband was sitting with me and he said, aren't you nervous, aren't you nervous? I said, no, I'm not nervous at all. I have total confidence in Dr. Williams, total confidence. If you want to save your vision, you should always take your wife's advice and go to the eye doctor, <laughs> you know. That patient's wife made him go get an eye exam. Um, I want to tell you something about your glaucoma doctor that you might not know. Your glaucoma specialist um, 
spends his or her life devoted to saving, treating and saving vision. And I know this is about patients, but we get attached to you too because you're in our lives for a long time and we see you and we fight together with you and we walk the journey with you. And we get attached to you and we care about you very much. So next time you go to your glaucoma specialist, just remember that quietly, that this person, it's, it's, a, it's a relationship between two people that are fighting for the same goals and it's truly incredible. And we love having you in our lives. You're super, super special people. So um, see you um, again uh, when we do this again someday.